Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Big Data Pilot Demo Day number four, IBITAS application to the telecommunication sector. Uh, I would like to give one to two minutes for people to, to join us and then we can start. Uh, here you can see the today's uh, speakers. So I hope you are all here. Uh, let's start. Uh, welcome to the Big Data Pilot Demo Day number four, IBITAS application to the telecommunication sector. My name is Desmina Kopanaki. I'm project manager at Fourth. Fourth is coordinating uh, the IBITAS project. I would like to thank you for being here today with us. It is our great pleasure to demonstrate you um, uh, the IBITAS solution. Um, so, uh, let's start. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce you to today's uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Dusan Jakovetic. Uh, Dusan is an assistant professor at the University of Novi Sad in Serbia, and he's also the IBIDA scientific and technical manager. Uh, today with us also is uh, Dr. Ioannis Arapakis. Uh, Ioannis is a researcher at Telefonica in Spain. Telefonica is one of the IBIDAS uh, data providers. Uh, so, a quick overview of today's agenda. Uh, first of all, we have the pleasure uh, to have today with us Marik Williams from Trust IT, representing Policy Cloud uh, Project. Uh, she is going to give an overview of the Big Data Pilot Demo Days, which is a joint effort uh, between uh, Big Data Stack, IVDAS, Track and Know, and Policy Cloud. Uh, then uh, Dusan uh, will um, continue with the presentation of uh, the IBIDAS uh, project, an overview pre presentation. Ioannis will follow. Uh, she's going to, he's going to dis describe uh, the requirements uh, for Telefonica, why they actually participate in IBIDAS. Uh, then Dusan is going uh, to present the scientific and technical view of the IBIDAS architecture and how uh, it successfully addresses the requirements that Telefonica set. Uh, then Ioannis uh, will uh, demonstrate the IBITA solution and its application to the, to the telecommunication sector in a step-by-step -step fashion. Uh, at the end, we will open the floor uh, for questions and answers. Uh, let me say a few things here. First of all, you are all muted now. Uh, you will have the opportunity to post your questions in the Q&A panel. And uh, at the end, our speakers will be more than happy uh, to reply to all of your questions. Uh, you also have the opportunity uh, to raise the hand, there is a button, and uh, we will give the floor uh, to you for a fruitful discussion. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, we would like to um, learn a few things about your background. Um, Diego, may I kindly ask you to launch the poll? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, for uh, quick questions, uh, let's have one to two minutes uh, to reply. Uh, so, the first question is about uh, which uh, stakeholder type uh, do you belong? Uh, let's give some time to people to start uh, replying. Uh, the other question is okay. uh, if people are working with big data, if they are interested in uh, big data technologies and the main barrier or risk preventing from implementing big data analytic solutions. So people started. Yes. From what I can see. I see a lot of people from uh, research and academia, 54%. Uh, uh, then uh, we have uh, big data technology providers, 14%. Uh, Great. Um, then, uh, are you working with big data? 65% uh, said yes, 33% uh, no. Um, and uh, if you're interested in big data technology, technologies to optimize your customer experience, 63% uh, said yes. So mostly yes. Yes. 
Uh, the last question about the main barrier or risk preventing you for implementing uh, big data analytical solutions in your organization. I can see lack of expertise, uh, 53%, 21% uh, uh, it's costs and 26% uh, is uncertain value. Great, interesting. Uh, Diego, uh, uh, we still have a few yes, one ninety percent yes. voted for now. Mm -hmm. So most of the people are from uh, research and academia or technology providers uh, here yes. today, and most of them are working with big data. So uh, this information is helpful for Dusan and Ioannis. For you. Uh, we do have 37% uh, uh, saying that they are maybe interested in big data technology, so we do hope after uh, this webinar to increase the, the percentage of uh, those interested in big data technologies. Uh, sure. Okay, so, so I think we can close okay. the poll. Thank you very much, Diego. Okay, I'm going to share the result with the audience, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, uh, as I said before, today with us, uh, we have the pleasure uh, to have Marie Williams from Trust IT. She is involved in the dissemination activities uh, of a policy cloud project, and she is going to give us uh, an overview of the big uh, data pilot demo uh, days. Marik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Despina. Thank you for uh, the introduction and the invitation. Um, so, yes, uh, I'm Marie Willems from Trust IT, uh, and Trust IT leads the work package on communication dissemination in the Policy Cloud project. Uh, Policy Cloud develops a cloud for data driven uh, uh, policy uh, management. Uh, so, when uh, the Big Data Value uh, PPP Summit uh, 2020 uh, was organized for May uh, 2020. This obviously uh, was in the middle of uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, or the very high uh, moment. So at that point, uh, the BDV PPP virtual summit went virtual, uh, but this then also provided us with some opportunities uh, to, uh, to develop this series of, uh, of, um, of big data uh, pilot demo days in which we well, we will, would like to take you uh, through this course. Uh, in the next slide, um, I will, so here you can see why the big data pilot demo days. So um, the new data driven industrial revolution highlights the need for big data technologies to unlock uh, the potential in various application domains. So this is also why we, we have a series, why we are showing different uh, applications in different domains. Uh, the BDV PPP projects, IBDAS, uh, Big Data Stack, Track and Know, uh, and, and Policy Cloud as well, they, they deliver innovative technologies to address the emerging needs of data operations and applications. And to exploit these technologies, uh, the projects onboarded the pilots. So they differ from, from uh, telecommunications, as we're looking in today, uh, to retail, to shipping, to transport in, in, in other sectors. Uh, but also as, as in policy cloud uh, to uh, policy making. Um, so in, the, in their third and, and final year, uh, IB does Big Data Stack and Track and Know, uh, they are ready to demonstrate uh, the developed implemented technologies uh, to interested end users or uh, from, from industry as well as the technology providers uh, for, for further adoption and obviously also research and academia as many of you are in this call uh, to, to build upon that. Um, so the recently started Policy Cloud project will highlight the adoption of the technologies developed uh, by the more mature BDV PPP project, Big Data Stack. Uh, so and of uh, seamless uh, analytical technologies uh, and data skipping technologies for the policy making sector. So in the next slide, thank you, Despina. So here, here we have an, a brief overview of um, of what each, pro each project uh, very briefly aims to do. So the Big Data Stack project uh, will build a holistic stack for big data applications and operations. Uh, the IBDAS project will build the industrial-driven big data as a self-service uh, solution. 
Track and Know uh, is all about big data for mobility tracking knowledge and the extraction in urban areas. Uh, and then Policy Cloud will build the cloud for data-driven policy management. So if you see uh, these projects are joining forces to showcase the application of innovative technologies in a variety of domains. Um, so fostering further adoption and contributing this way to, uh, to Europe's digital future. Ms. Pinek, if you can have the next. Yeah, so here, here we see an overview of really what this full series looks like. So uh, the first uh, uh, demonstration was about uh, IBDAS application to the financial sector. The next one on for retail, uh, the big data stack application for retail, uh, and also uh, this, a similar, so the, the big data stack solution for shipping was the third topic. Um, today we are in the fourth. Uh, what we would like to show with this is that there's a wide variety of, 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 the, of big data applications to a wide variety of sectors. All the, uh, the demos that have been uh, done already are now uh, available on, on each of the project's websites as well as through the BDVA. Um, so we really encourage you to, um, to, to consult these, uh, these webinars if you haven't been able to attend them uh, because they're very uh, useful uh, material um, that you can uh, use. Thank you, Despina. Thank you, Marik, for being here today with us. Of course, we will have you at the end uh, to say a few things about our next webinar. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen now and pass the token to Dusan, uh, who is going to give an overview of the IBDAS project. Uh, Dusan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Despina. Uh, my name is Dusan Jakovetic. I'm an assistant professor at University of Novi Sad, uh, Serbia. And uh, this is going to be a brief uh, introduction to the Abidus project. So uh, first, this is the identity card of the Abidus project. We are a project consortium of 13 partners with a total budget of about 5 million. We started uh, in January 2018, uh, which means that we are at about uh, half a year until the project end. Uh, the full project name is uh, Industrial Driven Big Data as a Self-Service Solution, and it's, an it's a research and innovation type project, which means that we do both research, uh, but also we, uh, uh, we try to bring this research somewhere closer to the market. And here you can see uh, links to various media where you can reach us. Uh, so as I said, we are a consortium of 13 partners, and uh, this is a well-balanced consortium between uh, research institutes, universities, large and small industries. So in particular, we have uh, uh, Ford, uh, which is the project coordinator, Barcelona Supercomputing Center, IBM Israel, CRF, which is a research center of Fiat, Software AG, Kaisha Bank, University of Manchester, Pond School, Atos from Spain, Aegis, which is an SME from UK, ITML, another SME from Greece, University of Novi Sad, and Telefonica Research from Spain. Uh, as uh, uh, several other BDV PPPP projects, uh, I bid this um, um, uh, motivation is uh, uh, in uh, European data economy, and uh, we are doing research and innovation that uh, tries to improve the European data economy. There are several challenges or barriers uh, uh, that um, we need to resolve in order to make a success. Uh, I'm going to focus on uh, uh, two key um, challenges uh, that are of interest to IBDAS. Uh, these are the lack of talent and the data silos. So by the lack of talent, we mean that um, the current big data technologies are so complex and diverse that uh, um, uh, several industries need to hire external experts in order to be able to fully harness the value from big data. Uh, now, these, uh, uh, these services uh, can be either uh, very costly or simply there is not available um, talent on the market. Um, for, for the second challenge, uh, by, uh, by data silos, uh, uh, we, we witnessed that there exist uh, data silos both within a single company, within a single sector or across multiple sectors that uh, if, um, if broken successfully can, can again uh, help us uh, 
uh, uh, through improving the data economy. Uh, for the vision of the ABDES project, there are several um, important dimensions. I'm going to mention three of them, uh, which kind of link to the previous challenges that I uh, talked about. So the first one is that IBDAS provides a big data as a self-service solution. Uh, and this uh, uh, solution kind of addresses um, the lack of talent uh, challenge. Uh, so IBDAS provides uh, a solution where in-house domain experts in, in, in industries uh, can uh, uh, more directly interact with big data technologies and uh, uh, in this way um, uh, harness the value from big data. Um, another important dimension is that through several project activities and several technologies, IBDAS is breaking data silos successfully. And finally, uh, IBDAS provides a complete and safe environment for methodological big data experimentation. And in particular, IBDAS focuses on three uh, targeted sectors, which are telecom, uh, banking, and manufacturing. And today, uh, our main focus will be on telecom. Uh, with uh, uh, this vision um, of, of the IBDAS project, I'm going now to basically read this slide to to uh, state uh, uh, what the IBDAS project is about with a reference uh, to uh, what I said before. So IBDAS aims to empower users to easily utilize and interact with big data technologies, and this is the self-service part, by designing, building, and demonstrating a unified framework that significantly increases the speed of data analysis while coping with the rate of data asset growth and facilitates cross-domain data flow, so this refers to breaking the silos, towards a thriving data-driven EU economy. IBDAS will be tangibly validated by three real-world industry-led experiments, and here we mean telecom banking and manufacturing. Uh, with this slide, um, just to say a couple of more words about the IBDAS experimentation. So as I said, the three targeted domains are uh, telecom banking and manufacturing and this is also an opportunity to invite you to follow the the subsequent webinar we already had the webinar on banking and uh, we will have soon a webinar uh, on the manufacturing sector and the final slide for this introduction is meant to say that uh, even though we, we we focus in IBDAS on the three target uh, sectors uh, the results and technologies of the project can be applied also to other sectors as well, uh, for example, uh, energy or health. Uh, so now I would like to ask Ioannis to uh, give us more details about uh, the specific requirements uh, uh, in telecom industry for IBDAS. Thank you. Thank you, Dusan. Uh, okay, can you see my presentation? Yes, you want me? All right, perfect. So, Telefonica is one of the largest telecommunication companies in the world by market capitalization and number of customers. We provide over world class fixed mobile and broadband networks and we operate in uh, 16 countries uh, which are split to, into two geographic regions, that of Europe and uh, that of Latin America. Um, we have approximately 356 million customers, including 270 million mobile customers nearly 13 million fiber and cable customers and uh, more than 8 million pay TV customers. Now, our users interact with uh, various services, which basically trigger the production of uh, large and diverse types of data at different levels in our network infrastructure. Uh, more specifically, some data are produced at the user level by end user devices like smartphones and laptops and include the data uh, regarding their activities like uh, you know web browsing tv viewing radio streaming uh, video calling and so on 
Other data are produced at the networking infrastructure level, that is by, by means of routers, antennas, and so on, as a reaction to the user activity in the network, um, that is uh, by phone calls, SMS, other messaging services, roaming, uh, traveling in the city, that is changing antennas, uh, web browsing, and so on. But both types of data are uh, extremely useful for modeling and understanding user behavior in an urban environment and can be utilized by, by the telco that owns them or by other telcos and third-party companies. Now, given uh, the volumes of uh, aggregated data, there are several other challenges that we have to deal with. First of all, the utility of the data generated across the network depends on how the data are aggregated across time, users and locations evolved. So depending on uh, where and how the aggregation and modeling of such data happens, it can be extremely powerful for marketing and other purposes like infrastructure planning, which is one of our use cases, uh, but it can also raise great privacy concerns over the anonymity of the users that produce the data. For example, on one hand, browsing data of particular users can be very valuable for targeted advertising, but it can also be considered as privacy invasive. On the other hand, aggregated mobile data or mobility data of users in a city that are extracted from our antenna logs can be useful in uh, deploying new infrastructure, uh, services, or planning physical retail stores without violating the user's privacy due to the aggregation that takes place. And of course, the anonymization as well. Second, by sharing across companies, uh, insights based on the user information and the activity. Uh, th this, this, uh, this information is regulated. These processes are all regulated and they can be extremely difficult to achieve. Um, hence, diminishing the utility of the data and the insights that, uh, that we can mine. Also, such sharing is not easy to audit and monitor, especially when it needs to be done at the user level or at least with the user's consent. Uh, we have uh, strict EU regulations uh, on user personal data uh, put in place, like the GDPR and e-privacy. Uh, therefore, novel methods need to be uh, researched to detect and stop such activities that may threaten user cyber privacy. Uh, these challenges become even more difficult to address when the data are combined from different sources within a company or taken to the extreme case combined across companies. Therefore, in order to, for such diverse value data to be utilized in a secure, uh, privacy-preserving and industry-supported manner uh, to create this EU data market, we need to investigate technologies like the ones we envision at EBITDAS uh, to, to be able to deploy them in the near future. So coming to the EBITDAS uh, platform, uh, Telefonica, as a telecommunications company, uh, we envisage to use many of the technologies uh, that EBITDAS provides in a unified platform to solve some of the most important challenges that I discussed in the previous slide. To this end, EBITDAS uh, can support the challenging faced by us by, for example, uh, designing and implementing a complete framework of tools that augments real data platforms with the functionality needed to enable a new and highly diverse and synergistic data ecosystem in a privacy preserving manner. Uh, second, by leveraging advanced visualization approaches and dashboards that harness the power of multiple heterogeneous sources and big data analytics. This facilitates the ability to take the data to be able to uh, break it down, understand it, process it, extract value from it, and then visualize and communicate it, with the primary focus being uh, empowering both uh, an expert but also a non-expert big data practitioner. TID's, Telefonica's contribution to this vision is twofold. Uh, first, uh, we provide three uh, highly relevant and high value use cases. Second, we contribute to the efforts of EBITDAS by making accessible to the consortium and thus breaking the data silos, both synthesized and, and real industrial data. To achieve all this, the data is the raw material uh, that fuels the proposed research. But as I said, due to the sensitive nature of the real life industrial data sets, as well as the substantial privacy and security risks 
involved in granting access to third parties, early access was anticipated to be highly challenging. Therefore, to facilitate um, the early exploration and development phase of the, of the use cases where real data was not at the time available, we resorted to um, sharing metadata and char data characteristics uh, in order to synthesize data. So by realistic synthetic data, we refer to fabricated data that mimics the real data set of a data provider based on these metadata descriptors uh, and other specification rules that we, that we provide. Um, however, it's not the real, the real data, therefore there is no privacy, or there are no privacy risks involved. Also as a step towards the materialization of breaking the inter and intra-sectorial data silos and, and support data sharing and exchange, we also provide the consortium in-house access to, to date, so specific data collections that are relevant and represent some of our use cases in a, in a secure and controlled manner. So these data sets address three orthogonal use cases and consist of very diverse, uh, very diverse signals that span from call logs uh, to streams of uh, mobile phone transactions for, for many customers. And they are the product of joints of smaller collections that are curated and maintained by, by various product teams. So to this end, uh, Telefonica met successfully both criteria of data diversity uh, data complexity and cross-domain interoperability. And uh, I believe the uh, expected outcomes of, of this research is to uh, integrate these, embed them into our products and improve specific uh, KPIs that we have set and identified and also motivate in the future or streamline a more secure data sharing both internally and externally and, and develop tools uh, that we can share and that, are, that they can support the highly dynamic um, and complex data analysis and empower both expert and non-experts uh, big data practitioners. And now I would like to pass the torch to Dusan who will uh, present the big data architecture and EBITDA solution and, and explain how we address these use case requirements. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, so I'm going to present um, uh, the EBITDA solution uh, from the front end, sort of what it offers to end users. Uh, then from the back end, what kind of technologies we are utilizing and developing and integrating in EBITDA to make these uh, functionalities to end users available. Uh, I will mention some uh, key innovations of the EBITDA project and also uh, show how we solve concrete uh, uh, use cases provided by the Telefonica uh, in the project. So what you see on this slide is a standard uh, big data pipeline. So going from left to right, we have users that have certain data, they analyze their data and then they can visualize or uh, share, visualize data or share the results. Uh, I'm, but I'm going to focus here on some key aspects of the pipeline that uh, we believe distinguish IBIDAS from uh, other uh, big data models. So on the side of the users, we, have, we provide three different modes of the platform, the expert, self-service, and co-develop, uh, that um, um, are tied to different uh, uh, types of knowledge that the user has. So the expert mode is meant to expert big data developers that can upload their own code to the platform. The self-service mode is meant for users that have some uh, data science and statistic knowledge so that they can select a predefined algorithm for a given domain problem. And finally, we have a code develop mode, which is meant for industrial in-house uh, employees that uh, will develop their own application with the help of IBDS team. On the side of data, we have a technology for fabrication of realistic synthetic data provided by IBM that um, allows, uh, for example, in early development stages when there is not sufficient real data available um, uh, to be able to um, continue the developments. 
or uh, this helps in situations where due to, due to privacy concerns, uh, the real data cannot be shared. On the side of analytics, uh, uh, the Ibidus platform offers both batch and streaming analytics, and we will see later examples through concrete telephonic use cases. And on the side of uh, uh, results, we can visualize results uh, and share models. On this slide, what you can see uh, is the Ibidus platform from the back end, um, where you see a complex picture. I'm going to break it down according to the work packages of Ibidus, uh, explaining uh, uh, what kind of technologies we have in there. In this short format, it's uh, uh, not possible to explain how everything works, but we will see what uh, we offer with respect to technologies. So on the side of uh, uh, data user interface and visualization, we have the TDF tool by IBM for, fa for fabricating realistic synthetic data. We have the software AGIS universal messaging, which is a message broker that makes the data available to other uh, components in the platform. And we have the AGIS advanced visualization toolkit that uh, uh, enables advanced visualizations. Work package three is responsible for batch analytics. Uh, there we have the COMPS programming model by Barcelona Supercomputing Center, which allows to develop um, um, algorithms uh, that can be executed on parallel platforms. Um, uh, and uh, within the project, uh, University of Novi Sad and other partners are developing advanced machine learning algorithms in the COMPS programming model. Uh, and applying them to uh, the concrete industrial use cases, like, for example, the ones by Telefonica. Uh, we also have the Hecuba, which is a data management system by Barcelona Computing Center, and the Cubist, which is a data indexing system. On the side of streaming analytics, we have the software AG APAMA complex event processing engine and the Ford GPU accelerated analytics. And uh, on the side of resource management and integration, we have the Atos resource management uh, tools and the ITML integration services. Uh, now I'm going to briefly dis describe the, the technological innovations within the Abidus project. So the first one is that uh, we incorporate in the end-to-end -end big data solution, data fabrication capabilities that I already mentioned before. Uh, then we have the solution flexibility, where we mean uh, the flexible solution with the three different modes of operation of the platform, the expert, self-service, and the code develop mode. Uh, we have the easy to code programming paradigm that, is, uh, um, uh, that relies on the COMPS programming model. And we have the high code reusability, where basically uh, we are able to um, develop a new machine learning model uh, uh, based on code templates by tweaking only a few lines of code. Further innovations are the synergy of complex event processing and GPU accelerated analytics uh, for streaming. Uh, we have further the feedback from analytics to data fabrication and to problem modeling. And all of these technological advances have been demonstrated on uh, multiple use cases across three different data providers and uh, three different industrial domains. Uh, more information about uh, our innovations can be found on our public uh, deliverables website and other sources. Uh, I'm now going to focus a little bit more on the concrete uh, uh, use cases uh, uh, by Telefonica, provided by Telefonica, uh, and the IBIDA solution highlighting uh, the challenges from the perspective of data analytics, big data technologies that we needed to address, and also highlighted some achievements that, uh, that we made. Uh, Ioannis is going to tell us more about these use cases. I'm going just to briefly provide uh, the context for each of the use cases. So in this use case, the antenna KPIs, the context context is that uh, telecom operators need information which sectors uh, underperform at any given time um, in order to provide, uh, um, for example, quality of service. And the question is, uh, in this use case, can we predict with uh, a sufficient accuracy which antennas will become the next hotspots? 
Uh, from the data analytics and big data technologies perspective, this is a highly this was a highly challenging use case because first of all we had a very large numbers of antennas uh, on the order of forty thousands and sixteen KPIs per each hour during one day. Um, the problem uh, from the data analytics perspective, uh, because an antenna can be um, a hotspot or not, is basically a classification problem. And the one that we needed to solve was a highly challenging one because we were dealing with a highly imbalanced data set. So just to illustrate, we have one class uh, on the order of 0.012% uh, of data. It corresponds to this class. So the data set was highly imbalanced. And also we have a certain data leakage when we split the data for training and testing. So the, the most conventional splittings uh, would not work in our case. Um, our approach was to develop state-of-the-art uh, fast and accurate parallel classifiers utilizing several tools. In particular, we, we used the, also the COMPS programming model. And what we can achieve is the classifiers with the very high accuracy that are highly efficient. So the results here show um, the accuracy that we can achieve. So you can see that uh, these numbers that should be as close to one as possible uh, show very good results. This slide shows uh, from the integration perspective that uh, the EBITDA solution can be specialized to the antenna KPIs use case. Uh, it's important to mention that this use case works in a stream processing mode. And as you can see, we are incorporating several uh, technologies uh, from EBITDAs. For example, the Aegis advanced visualizations, universal messaging, uh, the algorithms developed by University of Novi Sad and so forth. Another use case uh, uh, that uh, we have is the user mobility. So the con context is that users travel around the city and uh, possibly create congestions. And the idea is to predict when and where the congestions will appear. And in other words, the question is, can we predict the movement at scale? From the data analysis perspective, this was also a challenging problem because again, we are facing uh, with a high volume data set, but another particular challenge was that even though the data set is of high quality, we had lots of missing data. So in particular, on the order of 85% of data was missing. And uh, for this, we employ the time series approach. So basically we train the time series for each of the antennas. And uh, we had a, a very large number of antennas on the order of 100K. So we need a high parallelization of the process to make it efficient. So for this, we use the, the, the job lib library. And uh, the results um, are that we can achieve a good accuracy. Um, so uh, the average mean absolute error on top 1000 model was about 1.25, which is a, a decent number, though we think that it can also be improved. Uh, but also due to high parallelization, we get a very high efficiency where we trained on the order of 100K in time series within three hours. And again, we can see that uh, the EBITDA solution can be specialized to uh, this uh, use case as well, where uh, now we, have, uh, we are working the batch processing mode. And again, we are utilizing several EBITDA technologies like the advanced visualization by Aegis, uh, universal messaging by software AG, ITMLs, uh, uh, orchestration services, et cetera. And the final use case uh, is uh, uh, the use case on the call centers where the context is that uh, we want uh, to improve the operation of the call centers. And in particular, we want to, we want to sh shorten the call duration and waiting time in call centers. Uh, there are several uh, data analytics challenges uh, that we need to face there. Uh, so, for example, we need to provide real-time insights in a semantic sense by automatic information retrievals from speech interactions in phone calls. 
Uh, this corresponds to processing of large amount of natural language data, and all of this has to be done in a streaming analytics fashion. So our approach to solve the problem uh, was uh, to apply a GPU accelerated text matching where we are matching the keywords uh, in the incoming data stream. And in more detail, our solution offers uh, uh, different types of analytics, like for example, the sentiment score, the word frequencies, and the most frequent uh, word count. And this is all offered for different uh, time intervals, like the last minute, last hour, last day, etc. Uh, in terms of performance, uh, uh, we can achieve a very high efficiency where we are able to process on the order of 40,000 calls uh, per second. And again, uh, you can see how the IBIDA solution uh, uh, from the integration perspective can be specialized to this use case as well. Again, we are dealing with the stream processing mode and you can see that we are incorporating several uh, IBIDAS technologies, like for example, the GPU accelerated uh, uh, tools from Fort, um, uh, tools from ITML, AEGIS, uh, uh, software AG, and uh, so forth. So now, uh, Ioannis is going to present uh, in a step-by-step -step fashion, uh, the demos that we are providing uh, for Telefonica and also more details on the use cases. Thank you. Thanks, Lucian. I think it's the other way around. First, I will go through the uh, use cases and then uh, show the demos. Well, side by side, I guess. Um, okay, I believe you guys can see my presentation. Yes, you want it. Okay, great. So uh, we have three use cases basically that we are looking into. Uh, the first one is about the quality of service. So we are we are interested uh, quality of service in call centers. So we are interested in uh, improving the performance of audio calls uh, processing by automatically predicting the customer satisfaction. Uh, here, Telefonica at the call centers received. Uh, tens of thousands of calls um, to, to report problems, to follow up on feedback, to uh, inquire about uh, products. And hence, it's a, it's a high value problem. We need to, to understand how uh, we can process these calls in a more efficient manner and uh, narrow down to those calls that are the most um, uh, urgent and most important ones so that we can uh, address them timely. The second use case, is about uh, understanding um, uh, how we can optimize the placement of telecommunication equipment. Uh, this, this would allow us to improve the routing and placement of equipment in an urban environment. Um, so in this particular use case, we're trying to understand uh, basically if, uh, if our, our hardware, our antennas, our cell sites are, are um, uh, overperforming or underperforming and under which circumstances uh, so that we know um, we can inform a more a more strategic placement of new equipment or re or uh, move around the existing hardware and finally we have the accurate location prediction uh, with high traffic and visibility this use case is about understanding mobility patterns how people move around the city um, and under under which kind of context uh, and, and try to uh, and anticipate, predict timely uh, future events where people move at scale. And that's important because uh, when we have a very high concentration of, of mobile phone users in an area and we don't have the infrastructure to support that, that can lead to various connectivity issues and problems. So now, we'll, uh, after this brief overview, I will go through its use case separately and give you a, bit, a few more details about them. I uh, will start with the quality of service in call centers. So some of the uh, examples and questions that we usually ask is, okay, uh, why, uh, we users are calling to solve a technical question or to get commercial feedback. What is the, the call about? Um, how can we uh, automate the response or how can we identify the high priority calls? 
And uh, there are several requirements here. Uh, first of all, uh, we have the customer satisfaction index, which is a key parameter for many organizations that, are, that offer some kind of commercial service. And it's essential to, to reducing customer churn and, and increasing our revenues. So we need to really quickly get familiar and understand the customer's perspective and sentiment, and also shorten the number of calls, duration, and waiting time. So in other words, we want to detect the customer satisfaction and or dissatisfaction, if you may, and, and motivation based on the automatic transcripts, transcripts of the calls. So we want to automate the process of uh, this process of analyzing the calls and instead of relying um, solely on the human agents, we want to uh, put in place um, the technology that will help us uh, speed up this, uh, this filtering. And some of the challenges that stem from this case is, first of all, uh, how can we employ advanced machine learning techniques uh, that involve automatic speech recognition, uh, sentiment analysis, uh, customer satisfaction index prediction, and so on, uh, to understand the call intent and the sentiment. Um, how can we apply streaming-based models for real-time script adaptation? And also, how can we anonymize the transcripts? The data that we uh, have been using consists uh, of a, a mixture of heterogeneous structure and unstructured data sources. Uh, for example, we used 20 hours of speech manually transcribed for its language, uh, where the speech data were anonymized, um, both uh, using uh, automatic as well as manual supervision. Um, and uh, after this data was uh, analyzed, uh, anonymized, we analyzed also the uh, importance of various acoustic features that we extra extracted from the customer agent's uh, spoken interaction. Uh, in trying to predict, again, uh, eventually the self-reported customer satisfaction, which is our ground truth. And there has been uh, some ongoing research on that. I'm, I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but we, we've been trying various deep learning and machine learning models, uh, testing the, the importance of different kind of features, um, either linguistic features or acoustic features uh, and so on. And we, we, we tried also different kind of architecture like uh, convolutional neural nets. And, and we came out the conclusion that a com usually a combination of the different um, um, categories of features uh, is, is, is usually works better for us. Um, so the, this, this uh, use case has uh, also a, a very specific KPIs. Uh, currently there is no automated solution in place. Uh, so th which means that the audio calls are processed by human agents. And as you can understand, this is very costly and time consuming solution. To be more precise, um, if we consider an average call duration of 8.6 minutes, uh, a human agent following a work schedule of 40 hours per week, uh, that is 160 hours per month, could help process up to 11K calls per year. And this manual process allows uh, one agent to flag about 2,300 low customer satisfaction calls that require further and immediate attention and can lead to customer churn. Now the EBITDA's platform with a configuration of one CPU core um, can process 12 times those many calls per hour, which means uh, it can process about 100K calls per year. And this increases the detection of low customer satisfaction calls by human agents from 2,300 to 7,000, and that's 200% uh, improvement. Um, and, the, uh, and a solution from Processing the, the customer audio calls in an automatic and scalable manner can go a long way, increasing the number of, uh, of low customer satisfaction calls detected and, and hence um, in, in, uh, addressed uh, timely. And now we'll uh, go uh, demonstrate the uh, dashboard for this particular use case. Okay, so uh, this dashboard the map of Spain. And as an example, we have uh, pinpointed three particular call centers in three different cities. Uh, we have one in Barcelona, one in Madrid, and one in Sevilla. And 
Okay, the, now since I just started the demo, it just started processing um, the data, so it takes a bit of time until the, the data converge. Uh, so what we currently see at first glance is, okay, first of all, we identify right away the call centers where they are located, and we see also a summary of the um, percentage of calls that have been addressed successfully. Uh, those are the, the positive ones. Uh, and non successfully, those are the negative ones. Um, currently, we are uh, witnessing a breakdown, of, or which comes and goes. We can assume that this is due to the pandemic. Um, people are facing a lot of uh, connectivity issues with their internet, and the, the network is overloaded, everybody's online, uh, Skyping and gaming, and so on. And to the right hand side, we see for the selected city uh, for Sevilla, uh, uh, a, a kind of like a world cloud, basically um, the top 10 keywords extracted from the transcripts, the anonymized transcripts, uh, sorted by frequency. And we see what's happening in the last minute, last hour. And at some point we will also see the last 24 hours. Um, okay, I have to say that uh, for the purpose of the demonstration, uh, we're not using the, the real scripts, we're using uh, some auxiliary synthetic scripts, so these words might not make sense. Um, I don't think uh, somebody would assassinate, for example, an, a human agent or um, threaten them to assassinate them, uh, unless they were particularly unhappy. Uh, but you can get a feeling that by looking at those keywords, we can get a sense right away of what are the emerging problems, or in the case that we are dealing very successfully with the problems, um, what are, what are, we might get a hint of what, what we are doing good or, or how um, satisfied the customers are. And okay, now this is a geographic representation, uh, and now we have this uh, insights as, as to what, what are the top issues that emerge. But if we go below, you'll also see another chart, uh, which is, again, it's updated at real time. And it shows us the uh, uh, daily, uh, on the right hand side, the daily positive average score and the hourly positive average score. Uh, and also we have a, a curve that it's updated per minute. So here we see the uh, for the diff three different cities uh, the project the progression of the sentiment of the cause um, how successfully they are performed and again this is this is another kind of representation we see the temporal dimension so this gives us another view to the to the problem we can see how well the call center is doing over time um, see if it, at particular hours the call center is not working well and maybe you know this will allow us to narrow down to what is the cause of that. Okay, um, I will now go back to the presentation and move on to the next two use cases, which I decided to bundle up together because they are not the same, but they are somewhat similar. Uh, so the, the first use case, the, the second, sorry, use case is about uh, accurate location prediction with high traffic and visibility. And then I will talk about the optimization of placement and telecommunication equipment. So what is the accurate location prediction? Uh, well, basically it's about people traveling around the city and creating traffic congestions in the network. And we wanna know where they will appear next, when, uh, and if we can anticipate new events that will cause movements at scale. Like for example, um, a concert by, I don't know, uh, Shakira or something that will happen or Bruce Springsteen and then you know all of a sudden you have 50,000 people moving to a small space like a football stadium and then you know nobody has a good connection. Um, and some of the requirements are about you know understanding how we can forecast immediately the next events, um, how we can improve the routing and placement of the equipment that's already in place or to um, order new equipment uh, to be used. And the, the main challenges we, we have to deal with here is, uh, first of all, as Dusan explained, we need to interpolate missing events to recover possible event trajectories, uh, minimize the processing time with respect to the growing data size, uh, and also maintain a real-time delivery of results. Our data set uh, with respect to this use case 
consist of anonymous traces collected from a large Euro European cellular network uh, by uh, tens of millions of subscribers. And each such trace is a time series of mobile events. And these events contain uh, some kind of encrypted user ID. It's like a, a hash key that, of course, does not identify uh, the user. It's just a dummy a number that we give to at least separate this data. A timestamp and the location of the base station used to deliver the service to the user. And those, those mobile events are generated every time a mobile device um, activates or deactivates in a network. That is when the user switches on and off their phone, uh, makes or receives a call or an SMS, uh, moves from one location to the another. So that means uh, that's what we call a handover from one cell site to another. Um, switches from one radio techno frequency technology to another, like between 2G, 3G, and 4G. Um, requests data access, uh, and so on. And in this particular case, we want to predict movements from one sector to the other. Uh, we want to estimate the delta in the percentage of connected users per sector uh, AX hours in advance and our forecasting model can incorporate information about other sectors, current status and load, contextual data like the weather for their particular location or some occurring events like holiday events or other. Um, the requirements here uh, for, the, for the next use case, which is about the optimization of equipment placement, uh, we want to understand um, well, whether we can avoid deploying new antennas and use our existing infrastructure instead, uh, or whether we can predict with accuracy which antennas will, will become the next hotspots and you know, what models we can deploy. Uh, again, we need to minimize the processing, processing time uh, with respect to the data volume that we have to process uh, and maintain real-time delivery of results. So in other words here, we want to predict uh, those cell sites with high traffic and congestion events uh, in order to optimize the resource distribution. And some of the challenges that stem uh, are, uh, we want to analyze streaming data in order to improve the routing and placement of telecommunication equipment. Uh, we want to study the spatial temporal patterns and provide insights on the dynamics of the cell sites and as, uh, as well as consider deep learning models and see how they perform as a function of time uh, amount of historical data and the prediction horizon. So how much ahead into the future we want to make a prediction and, and see how that impacts the model's performance. Uh, so the data here that we are dealing with, that we're examining are basically uh, coming from different kind of feeds, uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G, uh, separated, okay? Uh, and, and they provide various key performance indicators uh, like the coverage monitoring, um, voice and data service metrics uh, about its radio sector. And such KPIs are the you know, key information uh, to understand a network performance. And we generally group them into these five categories, um, coverage, uh, accessibility, retainability, mobility, uh, availability and congestion. And the solution that EBITAS puts in place here is basically we want to exploit this KPI information to predict if, if a sector is going to be a hotspot or not. And as the main objective of the predictions is interventions and science interventions usually cannot be um, implemented on the hour by operators. So we, we aim for a daily resolution here. And we, accept, we address the problem uh, as a binary classification task. Hence, you know, our target variable is a a binary label that corresponds to the notion of being a hotspot uh, at a certain day. Uh, and alternatively, we also explore a multi-class prediction scenario uh, where we classify an antenna as underutilized or overutilized or working um, under you know, uh, normal conditions uh, based on a predefined uh, percentage of, uh, threshold of usage. And now we'll uh, conclude with a demo of these two use cases. I will start with the mobility data. Again, in this, in this uh, visualization, uh, in this dashboard, what we see, uh, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a demonstration. We see the, the map of a city. You can guess which city this is. 
uh, and we, we see how the antennas are laid down here. And we have, uh, we have also this um, uh, explanation to the side, uh, which indicates what its color means. So basically those antennas highlighted with a gray, uh, within a gray circle are those that are um, performing uh, on average, they're uh, one times the mean of their, uh, of, they have received uh, the mean of connected users, that they usually do. Uh, those that are marked with uh, blue or light blue are at the 0 0.5 of their mean connected users, or 0 0.25. That means those antennas are uh, underperforming because they have uh, fewer users connected uh, than average, than on average, than what they receive on average. And then we have those that are um, have a, are accepting 1.5 times the mean of connected users or 1.75 times the number of users they, 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 they have on average. So those, those are overperforming. Um, and sorry, one second, I will uh, move them up. And, and here we can also isolate those cases. Uh, we can isolate those cases by clicking uh, this button and say highlight those antennas that are uh, underperforming and all of a sudden, you know, identify those areas with antennas that are not utilized properly uh, or and highlight those that are problematic. The, so we can identify those areas in the city, the zones that we may have to install uh, additional antennas or show everything. And at the same time, also adjust the opacity to make them more transparent um, and uh, more visible or less visible in order to identify which zones are we looking at. And again, the, the legend here shows the, the results. And then we have different also kind of layers. We have a base map, then we can also use OpenStreetMap or, uh, or introduce any kind of other map we want to. So this is quite a flexible tool. And it's uh, highly intuitive, it does not require expert knowledge. And I will uh, proceed to the uh, mobility use case. Uh, sorry, the antenna KPI, uh, the previous one was the mobility. Uh, again, here we have, uh, now here we are, we are dealing with historical data. So this is, this is not real time. Uh, so, uh, no, sorry, this is, this is real time. This is, uh, this is a live view. And, uh, so we see, uh, here whether an antenna, uh, will become a hotspot or not. Uh, those marked with red are hotspots. Those that are, uh, with, within regular usage are, are marked with, marked with gray. And this is like a live feed and we are, witnessing what's hap what happens in, a, in the city of Madrid uh, as it mo moves on. And if we want to identify those, uh, those cases that are problematic, that uh, are, are um, overworking and the hardware is not uh, um, meeting the demands of the, of the users, then we can just show only the hotspots and, and draw insights with respect to the zones of the city um, and the areas. Um, then we can, we also have the option to, to see what happened in the past, like one hour ago or two hours ago or three hours ago or four hours ago. Uh, because in some cases, as I said, there are major events taking place, um, like a concert, um, like a protest. And therefore these are like, these are temporal events. These are not um, constant across time. And then this, this way we can identify that this is not a permanent issue. It's something that happened because of um, a, uh, an accidental high concentration of users in a specific area. Or proceed again to the live streaming and, and, and see what's happening in the city. Okay, and uh, with that, I think I can conclude my presentation and, and pass the torch back to Dusan. 
Uh, thank you, Ioannis. Uh, thank you, Dusan, for your very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I think we have concluded with the uh, demonstration, so it's about time to uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, before that, in the chat panel, you will find a link. Uh, we have created uh, a questionnaire. Uh, it will take you only a few minutes and uh, your feedback is very, very valuable for us. Um, and the other thing um, uh, that we would like to, uh, before uh, going to uh, the questions, uh, is to say a few things about our next webinar. And I would like to uh, give the floor to Marik. Uh, Marik, can you say Hi. about the next webinar? Yes, of course. Um, so uh, the fifth webinar uh, will be taking place on the 2nd of July, so that's next week at, uh, at 2 uh, CEST. Uh, the topic will be Policy Cloud Policies Against Radicalization. Uh, so as I said earlier, uh, Policy Cloud will realize the, the European Cloud for Data-Driven Policy Management. Um, it will provide uh, the integrated and reusable models and analytical tools, uh, and that way we will turn raw data into valuable and actionable knowledge uh, towards efficient policy making. Um, so in the next slide, um, there are some of the, the webinar takeaways that, uh, that we will uh, provide you with. So uh, the policy cloud services will be used to transform the raw data into actionable knowledge, as I said earlier. Uh, so this is very useful for, uh, for policy creators. So this is uh, practical information, also practical, um, this is a practical value for them. Um, and then the policy cloud adopts the data skipping and the seamless analytical technologies that were already developed uh, in the more mature big data stack project. Because as you know, we, as we said earlier, uh, the policy cloud project has started in January this, uh, this year. So uh, we are taking the, the technologies developed in the more mature project of big data stack uh, one level further and implement them into, uh, into um, the solution for policy makers. Um, the analytical tools such as sentiment analysis and the opinion mining software will be applied to Twitter data uh, to identify radicalization efforts and link those efforts to particular terrorist groups or, or attacks. Um, so how the analytics uh, will uh, also be used is to segment radicalization efforts. Uh, so demographically, uh, visualize radicalization trends and to assign risk profiles to individual suspects. So how analysis activities uh, will, reflect, will respect the privacy requirements established will also be uh, reflected within the ethics uh, framework and we'll also touch briefly upon that. Um, so uh, yeah, we would like to invite you to, uh, to join us on the 2nd of July at uh, 2CSA uh, for uh, the Policy Cloud Policies Against Radicalization pilot webinar. Thank you, Despina. Thank you, Marik. Don't miss this webinar. It looks very interesting. Uh, okay. So uh, let's now go to uh, the questions and answer. I, I already said that Ioan is uh, replied, but uh, maybe um, it would be nice also to, to read the question. Um, do you create separate machine learning models per language or do you have a global model uh, that can process and learn from data in all languages? I think this is referred to the call center use case. So Ioan, maybe you can uh, say a few things. Yeah, although this is not my um, area of domain of expertise, but uh, from what I understand is that these models are um, language agnostic in the sense that they can be trained and deployed in any kind of language provided that we have the training data or the, the data in general. Um, and maybe to some extent we could also do some kind of transfer learning. Um, Probably not uh, with respect to the linguistic features, but maybe with respect to the acoustic features, because those are there. There, 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 there are commonalities between languages on, uh, we, uh, in terms of how we speak and how we um, um, em emphasize words phonetically and, and stress out certain syllables and, and phonemes, and what those mean. Uh, um, uh, emotion, what, what those express in, in the dimension of emotion, effectively. Uh, so uh, this question was from Haris uh, Svirakis. Uh, I don't know, uh, Hari, if you want to raise your hand and we can give the floor for if you want to further discuss. 
Uh, in the meanwhile, we do have another question. Uh, is there already a process in place for new antennas location? Uh, for example, uh, for how to deploy new antennas? Is it similar to what you demonstrated? Ioannis, I think uh, you can take this one also. Yeah, sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Yes, uh, or you can open the... Right, yeah, yeah. 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 Is, there already... Is there already a process in place for new antennas location? Uh, for example, for how to deploy new antennas? Is it similar to what you demonstrated? Um, so this is an ongoing work. I mean, uh, so we don't have any process in place, at least as far as I know. Um, but this is this is a tool that we uh, we are researching in the context of EBITAS, and we want to also um, push internally. So we are we are showcasing these technologies, and hopefully this will um, uh, present themselves as solutions to these problems, and and will be adopted and implemented. But it's it's one thing to develop a tool; it's another thing for the technology to be adopted and put in place. That's that's that doesn't happen overnight. And you know, we are just finishing EBITDAs. We are on the third year now. Um, the technologies are now kind of maturing, uh, but they are still they are these are still in a way proof of concept. They are not uh, fully tested, fully deployable solutions. So. It takes some, you know, interaction and convincing to get there. But yeah, that's the eventual goal. Great. Uh, thank you, Ioannis. And it one question. That for... I get all the questions, the tough questions. <laughs> uh, so, and one question from me. Um, uh, can you please tell us your story regarding data sharing and data availability from the point that you started when you came to the project? Uh, and uh, are there any lessons you learned uh, to share with uh, today's attendees? Yeah, don't participate in calls about big data and, and data silos and data sharing. <laughs> uh, well, okay. Uh, the the true story is that it was a bit of an odyssey. So in the beginning, uh, you take the first step and you're not sure where you will land, where you whether you will uh, find your way back to the uh, Ithaca. So you have to go through a lot of adventures and, and deal with a lot of monsters. Uh, some of them are called uh, audit offices and, and legal counseling councils, uh, others are called uh, GDPR, and it has seven heads, and whenever you cut one, two more pop out, and all that stuff. Um, but um, it, it is an interesting journey, and it's an inevitable journey, because if we want to eventually find a balance between, you know, safeguarding the privacy and, uh, and the, secu the, the privacy of the user's data, but at the same time, um, providing them with meaningful services and, and, you know, making things work better for everybody, we have to find the, the silver lining somewhere, yeah, you know, we have to work things out. So yeah, the, the challenges are that you cannot, you present a project proposal and in three years you're show, uh, telling people that you're going to take the, a big jump and end up somewhere. The, the reality is that you, you cannot run, you just take one step at a time. But that in itself is not a bad thing because when you take one step at a time, you're more aware of where you're stepping at and you do so in a speed that will, un, it's less likely that you will, you know, uh, end up in a fall, okay? So you, you orient yourself better and you, you feel the grounds and, and, and you're more conf confident about where you're walking at and what kind of soil you're working on. And I think that's kind of the Ibidas story. It's, it was like this ambitious project that started with a big roar, uh, got everybody's attention, and then it went silent for a while. And now it's kind of like emerging from the cave and it's delivering what it promised uh, but in a way that people did not anticipate it. They were expecting these fireworks, but we came up with the solutions in a kind of like more uh, like a silent force, you know? So I think that's the, the story, if I can put it in a 
more creative words. Thank you, Yanis. Um, so at this point, I don't see any other uh, questions. Uh, maybe you want to say a few things about the upcoming hackathon that Telefonica is organizing? Was, was that planned that I would address all questions? Or? Okay. Uh, the hackathon is an, uh, it's part of the journey to Ithaca. It's uh, something we did, didn't expect it will materialize and we are still very doubtful about it, if I can be honest. Um, and the reason for that is because of the high uncertainty with the pandemic, the situation with the pandemic. Um, currently, our intention is that we will see what's gonna happen in July after people go on holidays, if this thing will blow up again or not. And then somewhere early August or mid-August, we will um, start preparing and advertising and we have two things two two scenarios in mind one is if things go well and we are not under a new lockdown we will push for a physical hackathon but most likely because of the travel restrictions that will still be uh, in effect um, and i and i think we'll we might get a second wave in september it's the most likely scenario we will have the possibility of a virtual uh, hackathon which is kind of like trending these days doing everything online like this webinar um, in any case we'll do our best to facilitate the hackathon um, we have a, a, a really interesting data to work on uh, we want to you know deploy our so we want to see what kind of solutions people will, will, will conceive will create um, maybe people will get more creative even more creative than us and we might be surprised positively surprised um but i think it's going to be an interesting event and you know hopefully this can be a physical event so we can see each other and and meet each other and and and, and enjoy the whole the whole um process if not you know we'll if, if if not we'll stick with what we have because when life gives you lemons you shouldn't try to 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 create a, an orange juice you know I do hope for a physical one, though. <laughs> Let's see. So, um, any other questions for me? No, I think we're done. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you, Yannis, for being here today with us for your very interesting presentation. I would like to thank uh, Dusan uh, for the technical presentation and what is behind the EBITDA solution. Uh, I would also like to thank Marik for being here with us. Uh, we do have more webinars, so stay tuned. Uh, so, uh, I would like to thank you all for being here today with us. Uh, have a nice afternoon and take care. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining and for helping out. Bye. Thank you. Bye.